In episode 428 of the Clive Barker Podcast, Ryan and Jose are joined by Joshua Milliken to talk about his new book, Septum. Plus, we cover some Clive Barker release news and other stuff. This episode was done over Zoom, so you can see us on YouTube video or listen on podcast audio. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram Celebrate Imagination shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Over 50% of the proceeds go to the Texas Children's Cancer Center, where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and celebrates and continues to be inspired by his art. He uses that inspiration to help kids through the Texas Children's Cancer Center, and we couldn't be more thrilled to continue to work with him. There's a news feature video that shows Don working with the kids at Texas Children's Cancer Center and his artwork. Click the side banner at www.clivebarkercast.com to find links to the video and his Etsy shop where you can buy his prints, books, and support this wonderful program. Welcome. This is episode number 428 of the Clive Barker podcast, and uh, we've got a uh, special guest. We've got Joshua Milliken. Um, uh, we're talking about your new book, Septum, uh, with us. So good morning. Morning. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah, it's morning for two of us anyway. Right, right. There yeah. it is. There's the book. Yeah. I love your <laughs> office, by the way. It looks very Thank black you. lodgy. Oh, yeah. That's, oh, that's it does. The goal. It's, this is my my own personal dark lodge up here yeah. where I do my creating and my, um, you know, necromancing or whatever, you know. Yeah. So th for people who don't know what septum is, um, it's kind of a, you describe it as a, a paraquel. So it's mm -hmm. like a parallel prequel of Deeper Than Hell, which was the first book that was released by Encyclopocalypse. And uh, Ryan, you made a, a quick review for it in our blog too, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. And, and we'll, we'll have a, a link to that in our show notes here, but, and, and, yeah, and and um, it, it's interesting because it's it, it's not a it's not a prequel, but it it follows Sybil, uh, who's a um, and kind of gives her life story and the, her story leading up to how she became the Sybil character in in the in Deeper Than Hell. But it's also more than that; it kind of is her sort of spiritual journey. I think, right? Absolutely, great way to put it. I think that deeper than hell to me the the first book deeper than hell was sort of a um Dante's Inferno where hell if hell were like a real physical place created by um non sort of non spiritual non metaphysical people you know yeah humans. yeah no that's a great way to put it too and, it was um, very much inspired by Dante's Inferno and the idea that each level you get to is more hideous than the one you just came from. I like the compartmentalization of the depths that are hidden under Las Vegas. In the first book, funny enough, the thing that stuck with me the most wasn't actually when the protagonist goes into the tunnels and goes into underground. It's when he's describing some guy who was like on spice uh, throwing himself at a wall over and over. And then at one point, he just does a big scream and gets himself against the wall and boom, he just disappears. Mm -hmm. And and the guy is seeing that and he's like, what happened? And you mentioned stuff in this book, like the back rooms. You mentioned stuff like uh, Async, the company that created the back rooms. And I'm a I'm a big back rooms freak myself. Yeah, um, have you seen the, uh, the new one, the, uh, the oldest view? Yes, I have. When he oh my goes God. into that- The rolling the giant? The rolling Woo! giant. Yeah, it's oh, awesome. So Kane Pixel. Yeah, yeah. He's working on a Netflix uh, backrooms project, I think. Right, with A24. Yeah, yeah. That's oh. that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, we should put a link to that uh, to the show notes as well. Yeah. But uh, the backrooms has become kind of like its own thing. I mean, it, it it's just this idea that somehow you can glitch out of reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that comes to play in, in your book as well, except... Much like in Hellraiser, the way that people find um, the strength or they find the power to transform and to teleport or to move towards a different plane is through pain. So pain is the catalyst. Yeah. Right. And uh, so there's a lot of this is like basically the diary of a Cenobite septum yeah. is basically. Yeah. <laughs> and and before we get into this one, there was one more point, uh, one more thing I wanted to kind of bring up about deeper than hell. 
uh and that was that was that i felt like more so in deeper than hell than in this one but uh drugs kind of made the main protagonist a little bit of an unreliable narrator yeah, I, I think they both are. I think they both are. Yeah. But absolutely. Uh, Sonny is absolutely not to be trusted. Yeah. Anyway, he he uh, he, he wasn't uh, mentally fit before the story began. And he's obviously going through some insane shit, uh, you know, that's causing him to, yeah. you know, yeah. um, uh, feel that he's on, on this never ending descent. Yeah. 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 So you you as you're reading it, you're you're having to make your own decisions as a as a reader okay which things are uh which things are his uh drug-induced you know hallucinations and which things are really going on around him right but what i like personally is how the narrator questions those same things too so of course like as a reader you're yeah. like this better not all be a dream and then the character is also like you know i better not just wake up you know this better not just <laughs> oh you know, yeah so it's all kind of in there. He he references Jacob's ladder and things like that. So it's yeah. kind of very self-aware of the fact that um, yeah. And then uh, going into this, uh, going into this book, uh, this new book, Septum, um, you know, it, 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 I was thinking like, okay, how are we gonna? Before we started reading this book, I was thinking like, how are we gonna tie this to what we do to the Clive Barker podcast? And then I read your first chapter, and I'm like, okay, here it is. You know, your yeah. your first chapter, not only does it, it's not, they're not subtle references to Hellraiser. Your main yeah. character is a huge Hellraiser fan and like talks about, obsessed. yeah, and talks about every Hellraiser movie, even the one that she hadn't seen because she right. went blind when, uh, when the new Hulu. Uh, the Hulu one, came out. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, you, you nailed it. Um, you know, in, in Deeper Than Hell, um, Clive Barker is uh, someone I'm making silent homages to throughout you know i think for clive barker fans it's very obvious that deeper than hell is an homage uh with septum it, it wears it on its sleeve to the point where you know like i said before we started i don't mind spoilers clive barker himself makes an appearance at the end of yeah. septum <laughs> yeah, right yeah. right it's a, it's a very impressive scene um it it some of these rants that ryan is referring to are almost like in american psycho when uh you know uh Patrick Bateman comes up with a little CD and says, Hey, do you like Huey Lewis in the news? In this case, <laughs> yeah. you got little sections where they go off yeah. on, uh, you know, yeah. hey, I like this one. I like Bloodline. I, I've watched Nightbreed. There's a yeah. part where he talks about Nightbreed. So right. it's, it really like is drinking straight from that fountain. And, oh, uh, yeah. absolutely. And, and, and Sybil is like, and uh, Sybil is, is a character that we like, but in some respects, she's the, the fan that where no other fan is good enough. You know, right. I mean, no, exactly. No, no, there, you're you're not a every every other Hellraiser fan is a poser, you know, compared Except to her. Except for her. Yeah. Right. She kind of comes around at the end, I think, where you know, she realizes how full of herself she was as as her journey kind of comes around. But no, that that's absolutely it. I have a, a, a good deal of connection to Las Vegas. I used to go to Las Vegas a couple of times a year for several times when I was living in California. I got married in Vegas. Uh, Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Mandalay Bay. <laughs> so, yeah. It, yeah I, I went to the wedding there in Mandalay Bay and, exactly. and Mandalay Bay is mentioned in this book. Sure That's is. right. That's <laughs> right. But uh, you yeah. know, we've heard about the people who live in the tunnels and stuff, the drain tunnels that live underneath the city. Um, that you go into that in the first book a lot about the communities that live there. Um, I think there was a I don't think that this is from Las Vegas. I haven't seen this in a while, but there was a DJ Shadow documentary. Dark about... Days. Yes. Dark Days. Was a... That was absolutely one of the main influences. And you know, for your listeners who aren't familiar, uh, Dark Days is a documentary. Uh, that DJ Shadow did the score for that's mm -hmm. about uh, the residents of what was known as Freedom Tunnel. It was an okay. abandoned Amtrak tunnel in New York City. And th that community doesn't exist anymore because that tunnel uh, was reactivated. And so it was cleared out. But it is this underground uh, community, you know, and we think so much about um, uh, the homeless as people who are there without any choice. And in a lot of ways, that's true. Uh, in dark days, you find people who seem to at least uh, have convinced themselves that, no, they've really struck out on a new sort of life. You've got these people who have 
gone off the grid within the grid. And I, I was just fascinated by that. So yeah, you know, I've, I've never been to New York. I have been to Las Vegas like you guys. So, you know, I've been obsessed with this idea of life underground. I read uh, Jennifer Tosh's book, nonfiction book about um, the mole people. I don't like the term mole people, by the way. Right. I think you should never uh, equate human beings with vermin. But, you know, that's kind of like the accepted term. And, and that was back in the 90s, you know, whatever. Um, it's a really good book. And I was obsessed with that and obsessed with life underground. And um, so when I imagined it, I put it in Vegas because I had been in Vegas. So I felt more like I, I could speak to that geography. I feel like, um, you know, if, if you're not from New York and you try to write like you're a New Yorker, I think New Yorkers are going to call you out in a heartbeat. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can hear my voice like i am so california it's ridiculous so yeah, yeah I, I had to uh, i had to relocate it closer to the west coast to it uh, to give it that but yeah that's awesome joe that you you recognize days because uh you know next to clive barker himself you know dark days was a huge influence right thing and... I, i've been go ahead oh no i was just going to say that uh yeah so there is a certain kind of uh retreat from society from people who live in the in the infrastructure and not so much part of the uh the visible society and uh and Las Vegas has a lot of mystery because it is in the middle of the desert and it's an a, a, an architectural impossibility made real mm -hmm. and then you always wonder what's out there in the desert and um it, in your first book deeper than hell and this one it definitely uh, establishes some premises that uh, there's more to it than we see. I, I There's some interesting references you put throughout the book, especially I like the special paint that is used to hide doors, mm -hmm. uh, which is number 42. That reminded me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. When, yeah, I uh, think that was uh, that was kind of the, yeah, the Easter there's, egg there. There's something yeah. that they they use the the fact that British people are very kind of timid and and uh, awkward, and sometimes they choose to ignore something instead of acknowledging it, and that makes it like invisible to them. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the same situation where it's like there's these doors and they're hidden, and you know, and you have to know what you're looking for to find it. And I, I thought that was uh, that was pretty amazing. It uh, reminded me of how. Uh, the Disney parks created a special kind of blue that that's, kind, that's of, kind of the urban legend I, I was riffing yeah. on there. Yeah. 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 So I could see all these things like mixed together in a big cauldron and septum. And it, it just keeps your brain like uh, jumping from thing to thing and keeps the sparks in there going off. And uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Ryan mentioned an unreliable narrator. But I decided to take this book with the idea that drugs are also a bridge to a different uh, reality. Mm -hmm. And if you believe well, yeah. that reality, it be it becomes real to you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I think the unreliable narrator I felt right. was more in the first book than in this one. Yeah. 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 Well, it, the, the two books kind of, uh, they're both very uh, steeped in drugs. I consider it kind of narco horror. Mm -hmm. If you've ever gone into that subgenre, but the the drug of deeper than hell is heroin, and so I went kind of into yeah. that like yeah. warm inner world. The drug of septum is LSD, which mm -hmm. is a much more cerebral and yeah. vivid and colorful drug. So, um, you know, and so you know, how reliable is a heroin addict? How reliable is somebody who's almost constantly tripping? You know, the, these yeah, are yeah. things to take into consideration um, and and decide for yourself. In I like um... I, I like the idea of LSD um, being used as the drug in this, uh, especially administered directly to the brain, uh, because we can get into like the Eighth Circuit consciousness system. You know, we can talk about metaprogramming and how how that stuff. You know. It's not like alcohol where it dulls your senses, you know, it's an experience where you can actually achieve higher levels of consciousness. And mm -hmm. in so achieving those levels, change your mind, possibly permanently. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that I appreciate that theme in this in this story. And uh, just the whole help nettle. Uh, how, do, how do you say that name? The, yeah, the yeah, that's a good way to put it. Hop nettle. Yeah, it's uh it's deeper than hell. Just the protagonist when he stops by on that small encapsulated kingdom of Halpnadel, 
and with the acolytes and uh, the things he goes through in that. I, I, I was having a hard time finishing that part, but um, it just, it, it was amazing. Like the nature of the game that Halp Natal plays and the way that he uh, assists these creatures uh, transcend their own limitations mm -hmm. by administering them with massive doses of drugs and surgery. It's just exactly what, you know, we used to talk about in, in Hellraiser communities or like Cenobium magazine or, you know, when people would make fan fiction and stuff like that. This is the kind of stuff that people would come up with and stuff that you put, you couldn't really put it in a, in a you know, a uh, movie. Uh, no, someone read audiences. it and said they, they'd never make a movie about this in a million years. Right, right. right. Oh. When well, that's, and, you know, and so what much of this is is internal too. I mean, a lot yeah. of this is a lot of this is uh, her own internal monologue and right. and and the yeah. things that she's seeing and feeling because of her uh, her own um, drug uh, experiences. And mm -hmm. and could you actually? There was one question that I had from a while back uh, that I wanted to get back to to sure. is, is on on deeper than hell. You had. Um, a lot of conspiracy theories and and i'm not i'm not super up on those so i didn't know how many of them were actual conspiracy theories and how many of them were made up yeah about 90 percent are, are actual you know and, and okay. i was kind of riffing on all that because i love uh conspiracy theories i don't believe in a lot of them but i love yeah. i love me a good rabbit hole you know and i watch a bunch of these youtube videos you know it's kind of like all right convince me do your best convince me yeah and then there are a lot of th things that really do um, leave me scratching my head for quite some time. Yeah. But yeah, I, I want people to kind of like, you know, go Google these things and then find, oh, yeah, look, there are all these YouTube videos yeah. and Wikipedia pages. You know, this must have been what Drew was looking at. You know, yeah. now I'm learning the same things that Drew was learning. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of them are real. And I hope that people will be inspired to like, you know, uh, search something, whether it's the back rooms or, you know, uh, Admiral Byrd and, and uh, the South Pole or things like that. You know, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of it uh, was stuff that inspired me uh, and urban legends, you know, urban legends that we all know I kind of riffed on. So it's just overflowing. A friend of mine said deeper than hell should come with an annotated version because there's. So <laughs> yeah. Much right. in there. yeah. Yeah. And, and this book had. Uh, probably more half and half right it was part uh part conspiracy theories and part true crime anecdotes and stuff too right right, right. and, and yeah. it was more cerebral you know more like thought experiments in, yeah. in septum you know things about how you, your own brain can trick you into you know falling into this nightmare world yeah one of the chapters in septum that really got me sweating in my seat was when you described the brutal black pain syndicate and their rituals um, oh yeah, yeah. Those were uh, those two guys in Italy. They they were pretty amazing oh, yeah. characters, and the the ritual that they were talking about, and the idea of this uh, blackout tattooing, and uh, that they would make on you know a, a ritual of like resistance and pain. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. I mean, it 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 really. I was kind of having the, the cold sweats when I was reading it because I was just trying to imagine it. And I was like, oh, my God, that would be... Well, you can do better than imagine it because yeah. uh, that those, that's based right. on a true story. That's not yeah. exactly... I changed the names and a few things because, you know, it, it, I didn't want to, like, totally just, you know... Uh, it, it's a work of fiction. But, yeah, if you look up... Um, I think it's just Blackout uh, syndicate or something like that. It is a vice video and you can find it. I think it's, you know, brutal ritual of ink and pain or something like that. Yeah. Wow. I, um, the, the best, the best, uh, way of creating a, a fictional character sometimes is to put a little bit of reality into it. That's absolutely, that's the best way. <laughs> absolutely. But yeah. what a story, uh, what a true story. And, and deeper than hell was both a, physical descent and a spiritual descent. And this one, the difference between that and septum, I thought is the septum is very much an internal journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, someone coming to terms with who they want to be and how they can become that. And then finding their God or being selected by their God in a way. 
and taking that journey. It's basically a, a, a pilgrimage. It absolutely is. And, you know, the a huge difference between Sonny and Sybil is that Sonny never chose, really. You know, he's he's kind of like a, a, a leaf caught up in a, a torrent, you know, and he's just right. going where the, the torrent's taking him. Sybil's choosing to go underground. You know, this isn't, you know, she she's not falling down holes. She's not being dragged down, kicking and screaming. Right. She's trying to find her way there as efficiently as possible, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, well, she got an invitation and she took an elevator instead right. of fighting her way through monsters. and Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I particularly enjoyed also going back to Deeper Than Hell, how the different levels that the character goes through, the protagonist, become increasingly more abstract and hard to describe and more almost Lovecraftian, like to the point where at the end it's just these like dumb you know, not even human creatures and this glowing yeah. womb of the earth uh, of sorts, right. almost like almost angelic in a way, but not really. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and this one we have the great pendulum, which is the mm -hmm. the, the, the god that uh, Sybil is uh, is chasing, uh, or maybe a god, or maybe the god. Uh, so the great pendulum was a a very interesting concept. Um, you also have a, a podcast about especially uh, cannabis and horror. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about your podcast? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's not around anymore. It, it wasn't a podcast. It was an actual web series. Uh, mm. This was kicking off right before the pandemic. It was called Chronic Horror. And it was a talk show with me as a horror expert. And I would have guests on and I would get them stoned and we would watch a horror movie together. So you've got elements of drunk history, you've got elements of mystery science theater right. 2000. And I also had um, a cannabis cook who would uh, create wonderful horror themed munchies that we would enjoy during our show. So you can find it. Uh, it I think it's on the Dread Central YouTube channel. Just search for Chronic Horror. There are eight episodes. Um, you know, we were doing about uh, four episodes every three months. We filmed in August. Uh, we filmed in November. We were planning to film again in March or April of 2020. That's when everything shut down. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'd love to get it going again, maybe in podcast form, um, you know, or maybe try to find a, a new producer for that. You know, uh, when the pandemic was over, the producer had kind of shifted, shifted their uh, marketing strategy to acquiring more pre-made things as opposed to producing original content it's all right you know shows are expensive but uh yeah it was a blast for me to do i uh, got some got some really fun moments there and uh i i just love you know there there's no um direct connection between cannabis and horror movies but a lot of people who enjoy horror movies and horror literature also enjoy cannabis so if you're in that that space that encapsulates them both i just think it's a wonderful yeah. to explore it is. I've I've watched uh, Hellraiser High, and I got insights that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Um, I mean, what don't I watch High? You know, right. and, and that goes with writing too, and with you know, e even when I'm doing journalism and reviewing a film, you know, it's like uh, that really does help you get past the analytical state, and it helps your brain just pop in ways that it might not do otherwise. Yeah, except don't ask me to read high because I'll just be reading the same page over and over. Yeah, uh, I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, wait, I read this already. <laughs> oh, man, I, I get so high sometimes back in the day that I'd watch a movie on Netflix and then forget that I watched it and watch it again. <laughs> sometimes that, help, that happens to me. My wife is like, hey, you remember watching that movie? I'm like, no, when did I watch it? She's like, yeah, you're I probably I would do the stung. same thing. I had this ex-girlfriend where I was all, oh, man, I saw the craziest movie. And I would describe it to her. And she'd be like, you described that same movie to me two months ago. And I'd be like. Right. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah. um, uh, Septum is being released by Encyclopocalypse. Uh, yeah. How did you it's get it? It's already uh, out, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's it came out, out yeah. in it came out in June. Mm -hmm. So um, what was your how question? Did you, how did you get approached by Encyclopocalypse? Well, I'm a, a lucky dude. Uh, that's how you know I had um, written deeper than hell before I became editor in chief at Dread Central. And when I became editor in chief at Dread Central, I just put all of my efforts into the site, into you know that site's legacy, and I put all my own creative projects on a shelf. And then a couple of years ago, 
my son was about to be born and I'm thinking about the next uh, chapter in my life. You know, being a uh, being an editor in chief means you're working weekends and all hours, you know, putting out fires whenever they occur, phone calls in the middle of dinner and things like that. So that that was all going to have to change for me. So then I dusted off this uh, creative project I had. It was a novella. And I thought I had an in with a certain publisher, but this publisher was like, you know, getting kind of squirrely on it. So I was really disappointed. And I just put it out on Facebook. I was like, hey, anyone know of any indie publishers who might be uh, interested in my gross, disgusting, transgressive, uh, psychedelic horror novel? And, and one, one dude got back to me, Sean Duriger. And man, that is the saint of indie publishing. He read it. <laughs> he thought that it was really wild and totally out there and it totally fit their theme. Yeah. And a, a relationship was born. Now, I should mention Encyclopocalypse was founded and is currently run by Mark Miller, who's a Clive yeah. Barker associate. Uh, he was, and, a, um, you know, they were Christian in Francis, who also uh, uh, Christian Francis, who also worked with Clive Barker. Absolutely. And, and yeah. Christian Francis did the covers. He did both covers for yeah. uh, Septum and Deeper Than Hell. And I love yeah. his style. I love his style. So, you know, I, I'm at a company that, you know, has uh, direct links to Clive Barker. Part, you know, and that's part of why I think it makes such a great home for my story. They, they published uh, they published the Hell, Hellraiser 4 uh, script. For they P. did, Bloodlines, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and Peter Atkins, who wrote that, he did a he he gave me a great blurb on Deeper Than Hell as well, which I, oh, I think nice. it definitely helps sell some copies when you have one of the architects of the Hellraiser franchise saying this is a great book. Yeah, and Nick Garris described uh, Deeper Than Hell as a phantasmagoria of beautifully rendered madness. So that that's a pretty <laughs> good thing to have on your cover. Thank you, Mick Garris. I love yeah. that guy. He's yeah. he's another saint of horror. Yeah, I mean, are you? Uh, do you already have the Hellraiser Quartet of Torment that's coming out? The box, I do not. The box. Yeah, oh, it's is, is that the one a, with the, the first four movies? Yes, and it's going to have a work print of Bloodline in there as well for the first time available you know, commercially. I yeah. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I actually played a small role in helping to bring that to fruition. One of the producers on that had been trying to get a hold of uh, was it Dan Yeager, Kevin, Kevin Yeager, Kevin Yeager the, yeah. the director, right. he, he did uh, the effects for the child's play. He basically invented Chucky. Um, yeah. You know, he, he was so upset with the way bloodline turned out that he took his name off the script or he tried to. Yeah. He, he yeah. might've. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he did. He's it's, it's credited as uh, Oh God. What's that name? Is it Smithy? Yeah, Alan, Alan Smithy. Smithy. Yeah. yeah. Alan Smithy. So anyway, uh, a producer friend of mine who works with Arrow, trying to, they wanted to do with Bloodline what's already been done with uh, the Cabal Cut and things like that, where you get these work work prints and you kind of, you know, make a director's cut as good as you can get. You kind of have to use your imagination. Yeah. They had not been able to get a hold of Kevin. Turned out uh, about a year and a half ago, I was at a convention with Encyclopocalypse uh, where Kevin was signing autographs uh, you know, child's play related stuff. So my producer friend was like, tell him we want to have his work tapes. You know, we're desperate to assemble this, blah, blah, blah. She's like, can you, can you say something to him for me? I'm like, yeah. So, you know, as I wow. was saying, I went over, I said, look, the folks from Arrow are desperate to get a hold of you, you know, and, and he was hemming and hawing. He's like, I don't think legally I can give you all of that, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, look, they yeah. just want to know if it exists. And if it exists, they'll look into whether or not it's legal. You would just have to like sign that it's okay for them to use them. And that's basically what ended up happening. You know, it, there, he gets so much email and he has such a, a bad taste in his mouth from the experience of Bloodline. That he it wasn't even getting through to him, you know, the the official channels. So it took me kind of like going around and actually meeting him face to face to be like, look, there are a lot of people looking for this. There are a lot of people who want this. You know, can I tell my producer friend that you'll respond to an email? And he's yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote down all the information and, and that's pretty much how it happened. Oh wow. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Actually, that's we because we we uh we talked to him. We had an interview with him at Texas Frightmare Weekend in 2017. Nice. Yeah. Um, and it was like the first time he had an interview about 
Hellraiser four in a long time. And he finally came out and said, he'd be open to the idea of, of uh, looking at doing something like that again. Cause like he, he didn't want to be, you know, cause everybody's bugging him to do a director's cut. And he's like, no, you know, it's like, I'm, well, I took my name were... off of it for a reason. Yeah. And some of, some of the, the great films and the or great scenes in the screenplay were just never filmed. So it's yeah. not like you could yeah. take the footprints and, you know, rescore them or anything. There would yeah, be you take them out of somebody's brain out of the, you know, out of the script. Right. I mean, what are you going to do? So, storyboard it or something? Mm -hmm. You just can't, you know? Yeah. yeah, someone tried to do that. Someone tried to make CGI sections of missing parts of the script and put it up on YouTube, but it wasn't really that good. I mean, um, maybe with AI you could do some like stupid approximation. Sure. But I, I hate yeah. AI, so I, don't, I hate myself yeah. for even suggesting that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this work print came from Kevin Yeager. That's pretty amazing. I had no idea. Yeah, they, they just needed some of his. They just you know, and apparently uh, everyone knew that he had them just sitting in storage somewhere. It's no, just that's so amazing. These, so this work print, I haven't gotten it yet. I've ordered it a couple of weeks ago, but it's a pre-order for November 7th. So I'm, Mine was I'm supposed to, to arrive soon. today, but now they changed it to, to, to Monday. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, I did have a work print that we found in the Hellbound uh, web forum many years ago, um, oh, nice. which we transferred that from like an old tape that belonged to someone who had gotten a copy. And that one had like stuff from the reshoots. It had the Rand Ravitch rewrite scenes and it had uh, scenes shot by Joe Chappelle, like the holographic priest and the spaceship talking to merchant. I don't know if this one has any of that. I mean, do, do you have any idea? Have you seen it? No idea. I haven't seen okay. it. Like I said, my, my small part was just a, uh, 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 transferring a message, you know, kind of yeah. like trying to get getting to the top of his inbox. That was it. And whatever happened, uh, you, you know, I'll know when you guys know. We'll find it's out. It's going to be soon. fairly interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Septum was quite a trip. I I read it uh, this morning. It reads pretty quickly, actually. But uh, I think it takes more than one reading of certain parts just to get the right vibe out of it. Because once you come to the end of it, then you want to read certain parts again because now they make oh, more that's sense. That's kind of the trick. Yeah. 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 Something that was barely mentioned early on turns out to have huge significance at the very end yeah yeah, yeah it was, right it was... right yeah now i want to read deeper than hell again because <laughs> i want to yeah. i want to see if i can make connections to things that are alluded in this story well, well, i really that, enjoyed it and that investigator turns out to be an important character in the first book absolutely yeah, yeah. uh yeah. what's next for you What's next for me? Uh, well, my uh, newest uh, endeavor, which just came out recently, I did a novelization of the cult film Forbidden Zone. I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, mm -mm. Uh, but that was a lot of fun, and uh, I really leaned into the horror of that. I have another book coming out in July, and I wish I could tell you guys about that, but there's going to be an official announcement in Publishers Marketplace. So I'm sitting on that for a little while, okay. but um, I have been for the past year and a half working on a biography of Richard Elfman, the writer director of Forbidden Zone, the older mm -hmm. brother of Danny Elfman, who uh, you know was the creator of The Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo, which became Oingo Boingo. Forbidden right. Zone film is the first he film. He plays the devil, film. right? Scored, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Danny Elfman plays the devil, but he also scored the film. It's the very first film that Danny Elfman ever scored, and Tim Burton was a fan of the film which is how he uh, uh, decided to approach Danny wow. about scoring Pee-wee's Big Adventure, and the rest is history. <laughs> and again, this is a movie about a, a girl that finds her way into a tunnel underneath their family basement, which is, what is it with Underground that gets so uh, so I mean, much? Exactly. Into... Yeah. Totally, it's a complete shift, but it's also about oh, yeah. kind of this sprawling wasteland underworld, so it kind of fits. It's almost a within the deeper than hell world universe umbrella yeah oh yeah. speaking of that i didn't want to let this go before we mentioned that there's a big uh there's a there's like a, a page of uh septum dedicated to nightbreed and uh and the history of nightbreed and her yes. her fandom of that so you know that's uh, that's there for clive barker fans as well absolutely yeah i, I yeah. saw nightbreed in the theater when it came out 
I just loved it. You know, it was so progressive because it was like, what, 10 years before Buffy the Vampire Slayer started making monsters cool and sexy and sympathetic. You know, it was just so ahead of its time. People, yeah. people didn't, you know, I, I know that freaks like me who saw it loved it, but I just think, uh, you know, producers in Hollywood just did not know what to make of something like that. Yeah. You know, we always what hear to... reboots or potential TV series, and I'd love to see that explored. You know, one of the great things about uh, Nightbreed, you know, because uh, sometimes I wonder, what's better, Hellraiser or Nightbreed? Nightbreed has a sense of humor that Hellraiser really doesn't, you know, when, um, with Annie Bobby's character is, you know, going through the underground for the first time, it becomes like a house of horrors at a carnival, you know, where yeah, every right. corner yeah. she's seeing a new creature and something else is happening, falling from the sky. And, and that scene just put a huge smile on my face. I remember being in the theater, just grinning from ear to ear. I loved it so much you know i love, I love it when she comes across narcisse dancing with a corpse and uh yeah. he's <laughs> that's so that's wonderful scenes. yeah it's, yeah it's uh, also you know for the, seeing that for the first time it's also nerve-wracking too because you know yeah you don't know what's going to happen to her in there i mean you, if you were in there you'd be like oh my god i need you know, right she should probably stop going deeper in there maybe go back turn around and go hey, back man, she's got to find ben right yeah it's a bit like uh, Alice going beyond the looking glass mirror into the other yeah. side and uh, discovering an entire world, which was the feeling that I got after reading Deeper Than Hell and Septum, especially Deeper yeah. Than Hell. It's like you go underground and the earth is covered in life. It would make sense that the earth inside is also, you know, inhabited by something. So uh, and that's where. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that was. um Thank you very much for the opportunity to read Septim. I I enjoyed it a lot. So people yeah, should yeah, go get you. that on Amazon and uh, and on Encyclopocalypse. Yeah. Well, it's my pleasure, and you know, um, I love that people read it. I love that people connect with it. But considering it, so much of it is is about and for Clive Barker fans, this is wonderful being able to discuss both of my books with you guys, Deeper Than Hell and Septim. I hope people will check them out. And just one thing I, I want to mention here, we talked about it in the beginning, how this is, it's not a traditional, Septum is not a prequel or a sequel. It's called a paraquel, which means the two stories take place, uh, you know, along different paths, but during the same time period, and they intersect yeah. occasionally. You can read either one first. You can read Septum without having read Deeper Than Hell. And if Septum isn't your cup of tea, you wouldn't have to read Deeper Than Hell to understand it in its entirety as well. So... And, and from what I saw, Encyclopocalypse has a bundle where you can buy both of them together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And eventually, I'd love to do a third one, at least. I, I kind of have in my head an idea for two more Deeper Than Hell books. One would be Junk Man, and it would be everything from Thaddeus's perspective, uh, you know, because he becomes this, like, steampunk, insectile creature in um, Deeper Than Hell. So I want to spend yeah. more time with him constructing his exoskeleton and living in the, in the great bottom with all these outcasts of society. So I want to do a book about him. And then I want to do a short, uh, an anthology of short stories set in the deeper than hell universe that other writers do that I would just oh, wow. be. The yeah. So invite other writers to come and play in my playground, you know? Oh, that's cool. a bit like uh, a bit like the the stories of the uh, call of Cthulhu and different artists that use the same mythology yeah. to create uh, new narratives. Right. Or, or Del Hall Howison's Midian book or, or the, the hell, um, hellbound hearts. Yeah. 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 Well, like you're saying, you know, underground is, is such a fertile place to explore for creative and horrifying ideas you know, basically anything could be under the deeper than hell umbrella because it borrows from so much of what's already existing. And it's just such a, it's almost a world where anything you can imagine can manifest. So it wouldn't be hard to invite other people into this world to write, you know, uh, expand on characters that already exist or just completely new vignettes set somewhere that's already been described or somewhere completely new. Oh, yeah. I I, I think every time I... Every time I went through a different kingdom and deeper than hell, I think the one that I thought was the most infernal, the one that I thought was the most amazing was the one, I don't know that's if that's where Junkman lives, but it's the one where there's a huge amount of trash just popping out of nowhere. And there's yeah. all these like 
uh, cans of paint. And yeah. the people who inhabit this area, they, they've they learned to use the paint not just to eat, but also to decorate their bodies and, mm -hmm. and walk around in tribes and stuff. And I thought that was just insane. Like... That's, that is that the, the great insane. bottom where, where Thaddeus ends up. So I, I, exactly, yeah. I'd love to spend more time in that world. You know, it was just one chapter in Deeper Than Hell, but it, it could be, it could have been so much more. So that's why I think Thaddeus would be a great character to, to follow. And again, I want to write it the same way where you could read it in any order, you know, and it wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't be uh, beholden to one or either of the other books to get uh, an individual experience out of it. Of course, if you read the books together, you have a much greater understanding, you know, yeah. of the yeah. rules and the dimensions that I'm working with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so interesting. Let's see. Let's see if we are able to bring you back for a third, uh, uh, deeper than hell book. Uh, I would love to. Much. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. This this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us a little yeah, bit. Thank and thanks you. for the chance of reading this book. I had a great time with it and deeper than hell. So I do recommend people get the bundle with the two books. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, Twitter, I guess, would be the easiest way at Josh okay. underscore Millican, M I L L I C A N. And I just really want to thank you guys. You know, your podcast is is so well established in the community, and uh, you know, uh, it's just so great to talk to people who love Clive Barker as much as I do, who can really get into the nuances of both of these books. And thank you so much for sharing your platform and helping me uh, talk to a lot of your uh, longtime followers. Thank you. Thank you. This was, this was a lot of fun. I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks. All, All right. right. Lock on. Thank you. <laughs> the book is really something. I mean, wow. Yeah. That book is quite a trip. Um, <laughs> yeah. The yeah. There were, Clive, there were times I want to know when... what Clive thinks of this book. You know? Yeah. If Clive got a chance to read this book and if he has any opinions on it, that would be. Yeah. Because he's a character in the book at the end. I was like, oh, my God, where's this going? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. He gets assaulted by a by a rabid fan, who is the main character of this book. Yeah, I'm um, sure he used uh, that story about the guy who sliced his arm in front of a, an autograph thing. Yeah, oh, I, I one thing I wanted I forgot to mention I was going to say she only waited in line for an hour and a half at Texas Frightmare Weekend. <laughs> we waited six hours. <laughs> I know we waited six hours. Should we go into the news from the reef? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so first thing, um, Underworld slash Transmutations has uh, been officially announced. So it's got a new cover and a release date. Uh, from Kino Lorber. Yeah, the 4K re-release of Underworld slash... They, they're just calling it Underworld, but I'm still using the Transmutations title so everybody knows what we're talking about, right? Because I like that. I think it fits the movie a little better than Underworld. Uh, yeah. Although in Underworld, know. you think of the movies with the vampires and the right you know, and the werewolves and stuff. Yeah, and I, I like that they titled it. I'm looking at the cover for the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray for from Kino Cult, and it says Clive Barker's Underworld, which I, I don't know if Clive Barker is that happy about this, but, you know. <laughs> well, it, it's a marketing thing, right? I mean, I, right. I if I were them, maybe I would probably want to do that, too. And maybe so this is... he, maybe he's getting money to for them to do that, which is, that would yeah. be a good thing. Yeah, getting paid. Uh, so, yeah, Kino Lorber, this is going to be the fifth release of kino cult and of course it's going to have the 4k restoration from the original camera negative um it, it, it's crazy to talk here and, and say that this thing is already coming out because i remember when we heard about this from the director's instagram right george pavlou or something yeah it was like years ago three four years ago yeah yeah, and he said something like, well, you know, we might be able to release this movie. And we were like, I doubt it. And now here we are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's going to have a new audio commentary with director George Pavlou, moderated by Stephen Trower, uh, the author of Nightmare USA, The Untold Story of the Exploitation and Independence. It's going to have English subtitles. And the disc two will have a 4K restoration from the original camera negative with the same documentary, but this is going to be, I think, um, it's going to have um, the transmutations, an alternate cut, 103 minutes uh, in 1080p, 
uh, archival behind the scenes footage, which we've never seen any behind the scenes footage for this movie. So that's going to be a first, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I'm, Gallagher, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to, to know which cut is like more, uh, which cut is more extended cut is transmutations, the extended cut or is underworld the like extended cut. Hmm. So I know that they do say that disc two has a uh, 103 minute alternate cut, but they don't yeah. tell me how long is the movie in 4K. Yeah, I'm HD. reading it too, and I'm 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 not. It's not clear. Yeah, I think. Do uh, you have a, a laser it seems disc like, of this? Right. It seems. Uh, yeah, I do. It, it seems like back then, though, the American cuts were usually shorter, and shorter? European cuts yeah. were usually longer. I mean, maybe yeah. it's the other way around nowadays, but I think back then it was more that Americans would would cut out more stuff. Right, right. Well, so, who knows? yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to find more information because as soon as I Google it, I start seeing Underworld, the werewolves and vampires <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so who knew that one day yeah. we would be having a 4k ultra hd of of transmutation slash yeah. underworld that's yeah great i'm all for um giving us archival versions of this and physical media that we can keep and good so transfers of these movies so if you bought this version the only one you could watch is the 103 minute for uh blu-ray mm-hmm Oh, or, and on no, the inside is also just two is also 4K. And on the inside, the cover, it's gonna have the new painted cover, and then it's gonna have the classic cover with Doctor with the 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 weird face doctor with the, the yeah. lady inside the lab material the, stuff. The, the Erlenmeyer flask. Erlenmeyer flask, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so interesting. Uh yeah. you can I'll probably flip it around for the classic because I just love that one. You know, yeah. when we made the commentary track, I was the one who photoshopped your face into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I took that picture in the car and it. sent it to you. I'm like, hey, can yeah. you put this in there? Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. Uh, and I was I had a lot of fun making that poster. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, of... that's something to look for, forward to. Yeah. I can't wait for that to come out. And, the, and that is scheduled to come out uh, December 19th. So it's going to miss. Yay. It's going to miss Halloween, but. It's just in time for Christmas. Christmas, yes. Yeah. Watch this on Christmas night with your family. I'm sure <laughs> yeah. they will enjoy with it. Your, they love you for yeah. it. They'll, your family will love you for it. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Oh, well, you yeah. know, it is but what it is. But speaking of 4K Clive Barker movies, uh, the Clive Barker um, groups are all, everybody's posting pictures of their Hellraiser Quartet of Torments. That are arriving in the mail. Yeah, uh, even our buddy Joe has a copy of that, right? Yeah, Joe Manko, and and yeah. um, uh, mine was scheduled was scheduled to arrive today, uh, but then they changed the mail. They changed it. They're like, ah, maybe not today. That looks like it's actually going to be Monday, because it just got to the post office yesterday in Fairbanks, and so now it's going to be out for delivery on Monday. I ordered that quite a while ago, several days ago, and I, I honestly. This is ridiculous because it said at first it said uh, uh, there's no expected date yet. Check back mm -hmm. later. And this thing is supposed to come out on November 7, I think. And I just went to Amazon while I'm talking to you and I checked and now it says now arriving December 28. Oh, oh no. your quartet of torment limited all region ultra HD box set. And I'm like, what's what's going on with this guys? Amazon is kind of like glitching a little bit on this thing. Oh. Why would I receive this December 28 previously expected December 15? Oh. I don't know. I don't believe it's going to arrive on December 28. I think it's going to arrive earlier. But yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to be able to get this. Um, it's supposed to come out November 3rd, I think. <sighs> And I, it's for I some reason I pre-ordered me... mine from um from Arrow. From Arrow but, itself, okay. Yeah. And and ugh, geez. I man. did it through Amazon. So yeah. I hope it doesn't take until December 28 to get it. I but, think this yeah. might be some kind of error. Well, and and we are working on um and I, I I won't say who yet, just in case it doesn't work out, but we're working on setting up an interview with uh some of the people who who um did a special features on on that set 
Mm -hmm. And so that'll be in November. Um, and so, um, if you don't have your set by then, then, you know, you and I will figure out a way to watch the, at least that. Yeah. Picture. Yeah. Even if I have to somehow watch it with your help or something, I don't know. Yeah. We'll have yeah. to figure that out. Yeah. Point a camera at the TV or something. Yes. <laughs> be like, do a zoom where it's like, yeah. I'm watching movies with my buddy. You yeah, know, we should exactly. do that. Darn it. We should yeah. watch it together. We should do something like that. Uh, yeah. We'll eventually do a commentary track for um, the new work print and stuff, I guess. So uh, that's that going to be, be cool. Oh, yeah. That would be a great idea. Yeah. And especially now that I know from our talk with, uh, you know, Joshua Milliken, that uh, it was Kevin Yeager who provided this work print that's in, in this box. So yeah. I didn't know that. That was a very interesting detail. So I'm looking forward to see what Kevin Yeager had in that material. Yeah. Because the, yeah. the work print that both you and I know and a lot of people out there is just a work print that already had reshoots and rewrites with the holographic priest in space talking to merchant and all that stuff. So I wonder if, if that's in Kevin Yeager's cut. It shouldn't be. So I'm looking forward to see what it has. Yeah. Yeah. And, I'm always and, a sucker um... for alternate cuts. Right, right, and and I know I think that on was it on Occupy Media, and there was on some group where where um. Oh gosh, what is his name was saying like, oh, this better not be the exact same thing as that German bootleg cut, you know, had on it. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it I, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't. I wouldn't. I would say probably from what we've heard today, it might be different. But I guess yeah. we'll wait and see. Uh, Kyle Hart. Yeah. 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 Sorry, we've Kyle. Been talking, I've been talking um, to him a lot about this. He's been sending me a lot of interesting links. Uh, for interviews with Kevin Yeager and stuff like that. So I, yeah. I still have to listen to some of the podcasts, but he yeah. keeps track of what uh, what's out there yeah. about Bloodline. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I promise to, it's uh, it's that not that I don't remember you, Kyle. It's just that I, I uh, stayed up way too late last night. Right. Yeah. Same with me. Um, uh, I just uh, was looking for Occupy Midian and I just found on Facebook a memory from 2017 when we were recording the commentary track for Nightbreed the Cabal Cut. Huh, that was an interesting, uh, interesting time. Oh, so yeah, yeah it, it's always fun to uh, to do. What I, I want to bring up. Uh, what did you guys think of our latest uh, George Romero commentary track? Give us some feedback on that. I would love to oh, hear yeah. uh, how you guys like the Diary of the Dead. And um, I know that in retrospect, I feel like I was a little too negative on the movie, but I was just expecting something a little different. Um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. Survival of the Dead is going to be the next one. We'll have to. Yeah. Uh, and that'll be our last Romero one before we move on to the Evil Dead movies. Yeah. Those are going to be a lot more fun, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what other news do we have? All right. So um, there was, uh, as we're recording this yesterday, a screening of Nightbreed the Cabal Cut. And so kind of yeah. the last screening of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a send off of that era of kind of a that's kind of a neat retrospective on on a, a time of our lives remember we were really heavily involved in that uh night breed the cabal cut kind of stuff that's right that's right and this one i think i was very surprised to see this being posted i think it was posted by russell charrington yeah uh, who was very connected to that cabal cut uh, period and it, i think this was in france it's, it's the retro film it was called festival. the arff arg retro film festival and yeah. uh looks like it happened on a saturday russell was there and yeah he said so that this was saturday, the final the 157 of, minute cut the 28th of of uh october 2023 for anybody who's listening yeah. to this you know way in the future yeah and that festival that retro film festival um had uh an interesting poster with uh a totem made uh, made out of pinhead and then in the center, there's like an eye with a B from Candyman. And then they also <laughs> yeah. presented the Cabal Cut. So good yeah. poster for that festival. Uh, yeah. If you guys are French and listening to this, if you guys got to see that screening, tell us what you thought of it. Yeah. I'd love to hear. Yeah. And yeah. And I, I was curious to know which version of the Cabal Cut got played. And I had asked Russell on the, on that. You know, if it was the version from the Blu-ray from the 2017 Blu-ray, because he said it was finished, like it didn't have VHS footage in it. 
Um, well, he said that this is 157 minutes, so I, I would have to compare it to the Blu-ray that we did the commentary track for that was released by Seraphin. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the 2017 Blu-ray. If it's, if it's the same duration, yeah. yeah. If it's the same kind of duration, then it's probably the same one. Well, it's but this Lynn, this other person who was cut. commenting said that that's a different running time than that Blu-ray, and I didn't compare it. I didn't grab hmm. it off the shelf and look, but. Yeah, it says this one's 12 minutes longer. So it's probably, you know how that Cabal Cut was always being added to and removed and changed and whatever. There were very various yeah. iterations. I'm guessing it's not the one from the Blu-ray then. If the Lyndon Carroll and Occupy Minion mentioned that this is 12 minutes longer, um, I guess maybe, this, he, uh, maybe he's wrong or maybe what he has is not the Blu-ray that I'm talking about. I don't know. Right. I, I'm, yeah. yeah. We'll figure that out. We'll probably yeah. bring this back up on the next episode, and we'll uh, yeah, I gotta yeah. Check. If, if if we get any uh, any if we get any closure on that situation, or if you're if you're if you're curious, you can also you know go into Occupy Media and follow that thread, uh, and we'll put a link yeah. to that that thread in the show notes. Also, sounds good. Yeah. And then we also have something here about uh, Little Spark Films. Yeah. So Kino Lorber, we were talking about transmutations and. Uh, yeah. Kino Lorber's website, you can vote uh, on their poll, on the Kino Lorber poll for Little Spark Films movie, The Torturer. So yeah. I've been voting that pretty much every day. Um, Me too, as, as often as I remember, which is most of the time. I've probably yeah, voted you, 10 to 12 times now, I think. You can only you, vote once a day. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I've been voting that. I have to vote today again. If they make it uh, past this poll, they would get $5,000 if they get a certain yeah. number of votes. So that would assist them with uh, continuing their you know, projects uh, and movie projects that they have going on. Yeah. And then uh, that would take them to a second stage where they could also win an, an additional $5,000. Yeah. So that would be tremendous help for Little Spark Films. So if you guys... You can go ahead and click vote on the Kino Orber website. You only have to have an account on it. You don't have to, you don't have to put any payment information. You just have to create an account on the Kino Orber website and log in and vote. And you can vote once every day. And and the account is how that how they know that you're voting only one time per day. So that right. you have to do it for that reason. Um and then the last thing I just threw this in here really quick because when you mentioned Mick Garris in our interview earlier. That reminded me that the postmortem with Mick Garris uh, podcast is coming to an end, if it hasn't already. Uh, he mentioned that on Twitter, and I'm never yeah. going to call it X. I'm just going to keep calling it Twitter. So he mentioned <laughs> that on on Twitter that uh, that that was the end of the and I'll and I'll link the I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Um, oh, so that's sad. That's I, I, sad. I was subscribed to that. I listened to every episode and. Uh, really often, you know, news from our podcast came right out of that because he was, you know, working directly with Clive Barker on stuff. And, um, and, um, uh, we will miss the postmortem with Mick McGarris podcast. Yeah. But the last episode that they posted two days ago is with John Carpenter. So yeah. that's quite a, a golden key episode to, uh, yeah. to close it out. Huh? Yeah. Have you listened to any of it yet? I, I'm going to listen to it today, no, right after. I'm, I'm a little behind on on my podcast. Podcast, so yeah. I, yeah. So I've got a I've got a pile up of postmortem episodes to listen to still. Yeah. So Dread Central uh, posted that episode with John Carpenter. They talk about the 45th anniversary of Halloween, and he said, "I couldn't help but ask the horror master about the ending of the thing." So that that's the teaser. Um, Earlier this week or last week, there was something coming out that the cinematographer, the thing, said that he knew who was supposed to be like human and who's supposed to be the thing because of like this glimmer in the eyes that they they did when they were shooting. And uh, Carpenter came out to say, that's all bullshit. No, that's not. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So <laughs> let's listen to this episode of yeah. Postmortem with John Carpenter, and I'm sure we'll get more insight yeah. on uh, what happened with that ending. Yeah, that totally sounds like him. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so I mean I think that's about it for news. There was we didn't have a whole lot of of uh of news to to go over. 
So coming next, we're going to, obviously we're going to do, we, like we mentioned, we're going to do commentaries, a commentary for survival of the dead. Uh, we're going to return to Jericho squad uh, where we'll, I guess we're <laughs> such as it is. Um, that's oh going to be that last episode was a doozy. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't seen that one, uh, it was, you uh, yeah, you, sh you should have uh, titled it who will survive and what will be left of them. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I know. I thought about doing one of those comic episodes where they have like a, you know, the, the main character is dead and the bad guys holding him up, you know, by their, by their by the uh, throat shirt. or the hair. Yeah. 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 Like a this uh, like a Marvel cover. Yeah, exactly. Could this they be the always death of they Chitter always Beard? would they would always fool you though. They would say they were dead and then they weren't. Oh man, don't get me started on the death of Superman. Yeah. Uh I still have like the entire Death of Superman, Funeral of Superman, and the Return of Superman with the four different Supermans. Oh yeah. And and then it, it basically amounted to not a lot. And mm -hmm. um but it was interesting at the time. Making yeah. it to the news in Portugal that Superman has been killed by DC. And it's like, no, he's coming back. That's yeah. nowadays nobody believes that stuff anymore. Yeah. Yep. But yeah. yeah, so I recommend you guys go uh check out uh Septum by Josh Millican. Yeah. Uh it's a really interesting book. It's almost like a, a crazy Adderall fueled uh fever dream of a Cenobite's journey, even though it's not yeah. a Cenobite, but uh, there's a lot of mention of Clyde Barker and Clyde Barker stuff in that book. So it's, it's yeah. kind of fun to, to read it. Well, and we still have more, uh, more classic commentaries. Well, I think we only have one more classic one more. commentary. I yeah, think we just have a uh, barn of the blood llama. Oh, so wow. I don't know. Yeah. That one had some technical difficulties. We did it live from Texas Frightmare weekend in 2017. Yeah. Where Which was a lot of fun. Mysteriously disappeared. Yeah, I've never seen the disc again. I, yeah, I, hopefully and it, if someone it, has it, they haven't fallen into. Uh, and and it's, uh, it was madness. a homemade DVD from the people who created the movie. That's and, right. And it crashed in the middle of our of our screening, and so we had to like spin it back up again in the middle of our recording. That was a fun day. That was a fun yeah. day. Yeah, and uh, uh, and then. Um, we're, and then we'll get back to the, we're also going to get back to our boom, uh, boom Hellraiser comic. Yes. Issue, yes. Uh, and, uh, reviews. I got a feedback from Ed, our blind podcaster, uh, team member. He said that he listened to the boom episode and he liked it. And he said, you guys oh, should good. keep it up. So yeah. Thanks Ed. Yeah. So we want to get back to that. And of course we're going to be talking about Hellraiser, the quartet of torment, like we mentioned earlier. With some people who did one of the, some of the special features. Assuming that my box is arriving before December 28th, according to Amazon, because that makes no sense whatsoever. But oh, we'll see. Well, well, it, you know, I, I guess it. how much we talk about the whole, the set as a whole, or just talk about, you know, them working on that one part, we'll figure out at the time. Yeah, I mean, the movie's yeah. going to be the same. So, yeah. What's really interesting here is the extras and the work print. That's that's what I'm really waiting to sink my teeth into. Yeah. Because when well, I saw and, that, work and, print, and it blew we'll my have mind. a whole special episode of doing a, a commentary on the Hellraiser, um, work print bloodline. Right. That's going to yeah. be completely separate from this other thing we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have a lot to talk about. I have a lot to talk about. I have a lot of notes about. Hellraiser bloodline that uh, about this behind the scenes about this stuff, this work print that uh, we should bring out to when we talk about it. So Yay. that's going to be interesting. Yeah, that'll be fun. All, All right. right. I think we're done. And I've got a, and it's since it's Sunday, I've got a, you know, we're, we're late for how we, when we normally release these things. And that's this... fine. That's the beauty of podcasts is that you can listen to them whenever you want. Yeah. Well, and yeah, you can't listen to them before they come out, though. All right. I'm going to add those links and uh, I'm going to go back to working on my computer. OK. And this podcast having no beginning will have no end. Thank you for joining us and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker podcast wherever you find audio. 
Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. You can chat with us on our Facebook BarkerCast listeners group, our Facebook page, Twitter, or our new Discord server. Watch for our annual Kickstarter fundraisers to get some cool stuff, and you can buy t-shirts on our Tee Public store. Go to tpublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Opening music by Ray Norrish, end credit music by Matt Furness. Thanks for listening.